Thank you. Great. And uh, once again, thanks to all of you. It's so loud. I feel so loud. Okay. Thanks to all of you for coming back after lunch. Um, I'm hoping that the effects of the espresso balance the effects of the wine, and you'll be just, you know, average during this talk and not fully asleep. But, um, but yes, I'm happy to start off the experimental session today uh, talking about uh, topological magnetic devices. And I'm going to focus on proximity-coupled topological magnetic devices. You guys heard a lot about um, intrinsic magnetic um, topological materials. I'll say a little bit about those, but I'm going to spend a little bit more time focusing on some experiments that we and others have done on layers of magnetic materials on top of topological materials, which I think have a lot of potential applications in different sorts of devices, as I'll show. Okay, and these are uh, my collaborators again. Matthew Gilbert has done a lot of the theory for this. Axel Hoffman and Peter Schiffer have also um, worked, and, and Matthias Jungflick has worked on the, on the experiments and theory here. Okay, so um, like I said, I'll start by saying a little bit about the magnetic properties of TIs. Um, I added these slides before um, seeing the rest of these talks on the quantum Lamas Hall effect, so I will skip over those really quickly and save some time for later speakers, um, then talk about TI magnetic heterostructures, and then um, some experiments that we've done on bismuth solenoid on the um, magnetic insulator, YIG, and bismuth solenoid on just ferromagnetic metals, um, cobalt platinum. Okay, so I, I showed this slide yesterday talking about the really nice properties of 3D topological insulators. Once again, I'm going to talk about work mostly done on, on bismuth solenoid on, on our part, um, but on other materials for other people. Um, actually doped dichalcogenides like bismuth solenide or bismuth telluride. Uh, I mentioned uh, you know, some of the interesting properties yesterday, but ex explicitly for magnetic, um, magnetic properties, that what's interesting here is that these surface states are not only you know, um, have less backscattering and have other properties, but they also have spin momentum locking, which gives opportunity for separating out spins in these cases. Um, and they have hexagonal warping, uh, which affects their spin structure. And this is just due to the, uh, to the trigonal nature of the bismuth solenoid um, structure, uh, threefold symmetry of bismuth solenoid. Um, and I'll, so I'll show that this hexagonal warping leads to an out-of-plane out of spin component um, in bismuth solenoid, which is also useful when coupling to different sorts of magnetic materials. Okay, so... When you take a 3D topological insulator and you add a ferromagnet, you create a gap. Um, in this case, uh, ferromagnetism breaks time reversal sy symmetry, uh, lifts the degeneracy, uh, and induces a topological surface state gap. I'll say a little bit more about this in the next slide. Um, this is, in theory, an experiment. This has been shown very clearly before, where you can see uh, in material that um, as you increase uh, magnetic impurities, you, you create a gap in, in the bismuth solenoid band structure. Uh, I also want to note, as I said, that because of mostly this, this, uh, this warping effect, uh, the magnetic topological surface state has a hedgehog-like spin texture. Um, and this is interesting because even though it's a surface state, you would think that the magnetism would lie in plane, but you do have components that go out of plane on the surface of a topological insulator, which again makes it couple well. You can, you can then manipulate that. You can, with, a, with a magnetic field, you can turn, tune the magnetic moment in and out of plane, uh, depending on, on the sort of uh, studies that you're trying to do. And so as I mentioned, if you would just consider what happens to a, to a topological insulator when you add a magnetic field, uh, you start with this, uh, with this uh, spin split surface, which is ev spin split everywhere except at the Dirac point protected by time reversal symmetry. You add a magnetic field, and you create a gap in, in the states. Okay. Um, each gap Dirac cone contributes E squared on H to, uh, to the conductance. Um, and then what's, what people have studied a lot and what you've seen already is this is how you can get things like quantum anomalous Hall effect when you have uh, magnetic doping in these materials. If you're connecting between these two states, you end up with um, a chiral state along the edges. And in my... You've heard a lot of theory. I, as an experimentalist, I like to give very hand-wavy points of view, so sorry if this is wrong, but I do like to think about if you're, if you're connecting surface states with, with, um, with, with opposite spin contributions, you have to somehow connect them along an edge, right? If you want to have current go continuously from one to the other um, across this gap, there has to be an edge state in the middle, and that is your, your, your chiral E squared on H um, Hall conductance that's expected in this case, um, and which should be, which is predicted for the quantum anomalous Hall effect. Um, and as has been mentioned, you know, this quantum anomalous Hall effect is something that's in between an anomalous Hall effect that you see in ferromagnets and the quantum Hall effect where you have edge currents, and so it's an edge, a chiral edge current uh, with zero external magnetic field that's quantized. Um, 
I don't have to say, you, you've seen all of these. We all have the same pictures, right? This is the first experiment. I'll, I'll just say one thing about this, which is that, um, let me show more data. When, when you look at the data here, the reason that this is very, very convincing experimentally is that you see at zero magnetic field, very clear Hall conductance, even with zero um, external field, right? And that conductance levels off at H over, or that resistance levels off at H over E squared at low temperatures. And then if you look at the RXX and RXY, you should see the RXY go up to H over E squared and the RXX drop to zero. And actually, I like showing this plot because I think I saw, you saw a plot earlier today, which was much nicer than this. It had a really flat region, as you expect theoretically, at one, and it had a really flat region at zero. And I mention this because, um, you know, I think that here, this is when they had impurities and there's some thermal effects going on here. They didn't reach zero. And so at, when they improve the materials, they're able to get really clear quantized conductance in the, in the hall and zero conductance in, in the longitudinal resistance. But, um, you know, some, sometimes the very first experiments are not perfect, right? And so if there's enough convincing evidence in these experiments, which I think there is here by the approach to one and the drop towards zero, it can be really convincing anyway. Um, this is not pertaining to any recent experiments you might have heard about in the news. But, um, <laughs> but, but, but I do think it's worth, it's worth noting, especially for, for theorists who look at the, you know, the real experimental data and ask, you know, why isn't this actually zero, that it's often materials issues. And you have to understand that as, as, as if, it, if it basically follows the trends you expect, materials issues can be, will be worked out within the coming years, as did happen in this case. Um, and, and this has been seen now in, in all sorts of different um, magnetically doped um, topological materials, intrinsically magnetic topological materials, and heterostructures of topological materials. This is a very, very robust effect, which has been seen repeatedly in um, topological materials that have um, magnetism somewhere around them. And of course, now um, people are looking at what happens when you have, when you take you know, in the one case, you have the quantum anomalous Hall insulator, where you have uh, the surfaces have the same magnetic orientation. If you take the anti-ferromagnetic analog of this, uh, you get an axion insulator. To physically create this sort of state, it means that you have to create magnetic moments that have opposite directions on the top and bottom layers. So this can happen by proximity coupling to different orientations of magnetism by doping the systems, so um, carefully doping it so you can um, get different orientations of magnetism here. Um, and when this is done, uh, in this case, for example, they took a uh, chrome dope business solenoid and for, um, for the, the basic chrome dope business solenoid, or business, business telluride in this case, uh, you see the quantum anomalous Hall effect very nicely. And then when they modulation dope it, so the top and bottom surfaces have different doping and end up having different magnetic orientations, you see this, this zero step in the Hall conductance, which is a, you know, a, a, an initial convincing uh, piece of evidence that you have something approaching an axion insulator experimentally. Um, and again, this has, been, this has been shown many times over um, since then in different sorts of systems, but this is the sort of data that you expect there. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say experimentally about, about, um, in, about magnetically doped TIs. Um, they, they really enabled the first measurements of what happens when you couple TIs to a magnetic field. Um, they showed these first measurements of quantum anomalous Hall and, and axion effects. Uh, the problem here is that all of these effects happen at very low temperatures. Um, you have to be below the Curie temperature, which is usually below about 15 Kelvin in the materials of interest. And also when you dope these materials, you do add disorder. You add a lot of disorder by just adding carriers in these. You get inhomogeneous magnetization, and you get other effects that remove your, that reduce your quantization, and reduce the beneficial effects of, of, uh, of the magnetic of magnetism that you want. So, an alternative to magnetically doping TIs is to proximity magnetize them instead of putting um, magnetic add atoms in. You just put the material close to a magnet and hope that you get leakage of magnetism, and you can magnetize a surface state that way. And this is promising because of previous experiments which have shown that you can both um, induce a, a very good proximity magnetization on the surface just by exchange coupling. So you just, it's just an exchange coupling between the magnet and the topological surface, and you can clearly induce magnetism in the surface state that way. And that this sort of ferromagnetic coupling can persist to room temperature. Right? So one of the problems we said about the quantum laws Hall effect is it only occurs at low temperatures, and at least here there's a possibility that this sort of magnetic surface persists all the way up to room temperature. Uh, this has been shown 
And these nice experiments here on bismuth selenide and europium sulfide uh, with neutron scattering. Uh, well, okay, these are, <laughs> the, the, this experiment was a little bit complicated to interpret, but it did show evidence of, of, uh, of room temperature ferromagnetic uh, coupling. Uh, there's another experiment, I think, that showed this even more clearly. This is a topological insulator um, and, uh, and, 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 another, and a magnetic insulator. And here you can see the anomalous Hall effect. And again, it's a magnetic insulator, so the magnetic material doesn't conduct. So when you measure things like the anomalous Hall effect, the only conduction is happening in, happening in the topological uh, material. Um, and so in this case, they measure the anomalous Hall effect where the transport signatures are from the TI alone. And you can see that you can see this anomalous Hall effect all the way up to 400 Kelvin. Okay, and that has to be just from the topological surface state and the proximity magnetization. So that's nice evidence already that just by putting a layer of magnetic material on top of a TI, you can both maintain the nice properties of the TI and induce magnetism on the surface. So this gives us hope that you can see more interesting effects by making these sort of multi-layers. The other, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Whether this is a really, you know, exchange coupling or some sort of stray magnetic field penetrating to the surface? You, you want, you get the strongest effects from exchange coupling, so, yeah. Uh, can you be certain uh, whether it's exchange or stray magnetic field? I can't. So, so the answer is you can't, but if you just put a magnet, if you, don't have a surface at all and put a magnetic field on a TI, you don't see these effects. So, I mean, we haven't gone up to super, super high fields, but if you just go up to 14 Tesla or 15 Tesla, you don't see, you don't see anomalous Hall effect just by putting a strong magnet. In fact, you just gap out the surface state and you don't see anything interesting in that case. So it's, it does seem to matter that it's exchanged, though I don't, I can't prove that theoretically. <laughs> So the other reason that these sort of heterostructures are interesting is because, you know, again, we're talking about magnetic devices, and so I have, a, I have three device slides <laughs> again. But, you know, if you, if you are interested in, if you're wondering what the possibility of using topological materials in spintronic devices is, which I wonder about, um, then most, mo most spintronics devices are, in fact, magnetic multilayer devices. So you take one of the most famous magnetic devices, that's MRAM memory, which is used everywhere. Um, and that's, that's, that's a combination of having a magnetic free layer and then you know, another material and then another magnetic layer. You can see that this is a layered magnetic material. Right? So it's not intrinsic magnetic materials, but rather layered magnetic materials. And this works by basically you know, having the spin, spin from one layer diffuse into the other layer and rotate and rotate the orientation with an electrical current. So you want an electrically controlled spin device. And to do this, you have to have spins, you know, controlled electrically in one layer going to the other layer and rotating it. So you, it's required to have some sort of layers where you can manipulate spins to have any sort of device like a memory device. Um, even this famous spin, spin FET, for example, is, you know, ferromagnetic sources across another material with a ferromagnetic drain, and you can change the orientation of the ferromagnets. So the best control you can have of spintronics type devices is having multiple layers where you control the magnetism in different layers to build up these sort of systems. And here is just a, uh, you know, a review article showing all the different sorts of spin, um, spin devices, which are, you know, unlike, unlike some of the electrical devices I talked about where the physics is, you know, some of it might be used in special applications, these devices are actually used all the time in everything we use electronically. <laughs> I mean, some of them are at any rate. So, so, you know, all of the different potential spintronic devices run the gamut from, you know, spin RAM to new ideas about racetrack memory to spin diodes, spin oscillators, um, GMR. And so all of these require some control over, over the spin in different layers of, of these materials, spin accumulation, spin manip manip manipulation, or spin transport. And it turns out that TIs are really, really effective at, um, at, at moving spin, basically, because of the spin momentum locking on the surface. And so uh, another way to say this is that topological materials have been shown to have very strong spin transfer torque. So a spin transfer torque tells you how effective it is at taking a spin from a topological layer and, and transferring it to a non-magnetic non layer, or to, or sorry, taking the spin in a topological layer and transferring it to a different magnetic layer and rotating that spin, applying a torque from the topological spin on a different material. 
Uh, it's basically the Edelstein effect, which creates a spin imbalance here. So TIs of unusually large spin transfer torques. Uh, this is measured by these experiments in Dan Ralph's group, where they showed uh, that if you take a 3D topological insulator and put a magnetic material like permaloy on the surface, because of the spin momentum locking, again, you get a spin imbalance. When you put an um, electric field across it, you get net spin accumulation on the surface of the TI. Um, oops. No, we don't want to. That was weird. Sorry. Okay. Uh, the, spin current, the spin current then generates a, a torque. This is the landau lifshitz gilbert slonkowski equations, which are standard for looking at the effect of, of a spin in a magnetic material. So it generates a torque on the magnetization in the permaloy. And this was measured using spin, uh, spin transfer ferromagnetic resonance. They measure the resonance. They use an AC um, current in the in the bismuth solenoid and measure the resonance of the spins in the permaloy. And using this technique, they could measure that, um, that TIs have a much larger spin torque effect than other magnetic materials or than other heavy metal materials, which are typically used. Um, and you can see this in just the spin conductivity, for example. This is the bismuth solenoid. Um, it's, it's comparable to platinum. It's a little bit smaller. But then if you look at, um, at the spin torque, um, what is this number? Uh, the the uh, the spin torque ratio, which gives you the amount of spin torque per unit of current applied, right? So you want to have more spin torque with uh, with a lower with lo lower current applied. Um, then you can see bismuth solenoid is much 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 larger than platinum, tantalum, or many other materials. So it applies a, a large torque, but more importantly, it applies a large torque with a small charge current. And so. This has been shown to be effective in different systems. For example, um, it was shown that you can reverse the magnetization in cobalt. Um, what is TB? I don't know. Terbium? <laughs> Terbium. Sorry. It's been a long day. Um, <laughs> you, can reverse the, you can reverse the magnetization in cobalt terbium uh, from, you know, in a, in a multi-layer bismuth sol solenoid and cobalt ter terbium, and you can see that the, the amount of power consumed in doing this using bismuth solenoid is much lower than what you use using either platinum or tantalum, um, which is a pretty remarkable effect because platinum is what's used all the time for spin torque transfer systems. Um, and more recently, there's been a, an experiment showing that if you just, if you use a topological insulator with a magnetic multilayer in the same configuration that you'd use for MRAM, that you can get a switching effect, which is, which is comparable to what you'd see in, in MRAM type devices at, at even lower power. Um, and, and there's some controversy again about the mechanisms behind here, but this is just to show that people are, are proceeding now with trying to make these sort of devices. Um, and in fact, you can see that if there is, if you measure the, uh, the spin Hall ratio, which is just a ratio of the spin current to the charge current, you want that ratio to be high, then these are the standard materials used in, in uh, spin torque devices. Um, and these are the topological materials. And even at room temperature, they basically are much better than any of the standard materials out there. And this is because of the spin momentum locking on the surface. Um, and again, you know, yesterday I talked about, about transistors and said that topological materials wouldn't be great for transistors because you can't carry a lot of current. They just aren't as effective as semiconductors in that case. But for spin devices, you actually want to do things with a low charge current and have a large spin current. And so in this case, the, low, the current doesn't affect you. In fact, it's really good that you can get a large spin current out of a pretty low charge current in this case. And so in this case, these, these do have a lot of potential for actually practical devices. I will say that the challenges here are, um, it, it's a challenge to switch the magnetization of the surface state. Um, it, it's, it's, you know, there is a hedgehog structure, but it's unclear how you can control that intrinsically. And of course, it's always a challenge to integrate things with, with CMOS. In, in this case, I, I, I can't imagine a case where, um, you know, D depending on how you can deposit the topological materials, if there's enough motivation for one-off devices, it, 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 it's, it's at least more likely than a, than a transistor to be practically effective, which I don't know, I wasn't saying that much, but, um, but, but it's still a challenge to just integrate it with silicon devices. But I do think that there's a lot of potential here. Yeah, sorry, you're behind the thing. I can't see you. <laughs> so, do you happen to know if the performance of topological insulator was compared to something else with just a uh, uh, rush bar surface states, essentially? Uh, something with strong spin-orbit coupling, but with trivial rush bar surface states, 
where you would also expect uh, current induced magnetization to provide a torque. Yeah. Uh, do you know if it was compared? Because the, the comparison to platinum is, is a little bit, I mean, it's not unfair, but yeah. it's platinum, it, it's a spin hole effect that flips the magnetization. Yeah. Its yeah. mechanism is different. Yeah. So was it compared to, you know, to apples, uh, that thing? Uh, I'm, I'm sure it wasn't. So, I, so I, the answer is I don't know. And so the answer is, is, is it topology or is it a, is it a spin split surface state that's yeah, exactly. doing this? And, and right. what matters is the spin split surface course, state right. and how, and how effect, so actually. But I, here, here you have a, a, a single, a single Fermi surface in, in yeah. I think gold actually has a surface states like that. It looks yeah. like two Fermi surfaces. Yeah. So actually, so actually I do know this. And the answer is that. Um, is that it has been compared, and the reason the topological material is better is that it has a perfect spin splitting. It doesn't yeah, yeah, have yeah. any charge just, current just there. Just a single, single right. Fermi so, surface. That's right. right. Yeah. So when you care about, so this, this spin hall angle is, is the ratio of the spin current to the charge current. And so if you take a material that has a large charge current that comes along with your spin current, that's going to be a much smaller number, even if it has a spin split state. Okay. I think. Right. Right. So I don't have to, but... But, but, but the answer is, if, if it's, the, answer, I mean, the, the shorter answer is that, no, I don't think topology specifically matters here. Right. What matters is having a really well-characterized spin-split state right. that mm -hmm. vastly dominates your charge current in any okay. case, not, not something that has to do with any phases or topology. Right, okay, thank yeah. you. Um, and, and, and again, just, you know, the, com the comparison to platinum is because platinum is what's used right now. Platinum is the most common heavy metal used in, in these sort of spin -tor torque devices. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's not like comparing it to, uh, you know, your shoelace or something. This is actually state of the art in some sense. Yes. What is the temperature range in which these TIs are operated right now? Uh, so uh, the temperature here, this is, uh, this is 300, this is room temperature. And then, so this is a temperature scale here. Okay, so, the, so, it, so, it's, so this is important, right? It's effective both at room temperature and much more effective at low temperature, but of course you don't care about here for practical reasons. Although for, for, for just physics interest, that's really interesting. If you're trying to create devices that have, that utilize spin currents alone, you're really at this point better off using TIs just for any sort of experiments that you want to test at low temperatures. But, but even at room temperature, it's, it's more effective. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Does it have to be a 3D TI? You want spin momentum locking on your surface, not just edge states, right? So a 2D TI would have edge states that could have properties, but in this case, I mean, so, okay, the, could, could you use an edge state rather than a 2D state? Um, you probably could, but then I think your current, you, uh, I'm, I'm pausing because I don't know if anyone's actually done this in a 2D, in a 2D topological system. Um, yeah, I, 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 I can definitely see practical advantages to doing it in a, in a 3D system. It's a little harder to do it. I mean, even seeing a spin hall current requires some special techniques um, and special materials. So um, I, I imagine you could see a weak of an effect, though I don't think it would be as strong as you have here. Yeah. Okay, um, and there's also just lots of interest in creating new sorts of proximity magnetized devices. There's ideas of making nanoscale inductors out of TIs because uh, it, it's really hard to scale inductors down, it turns out. Inductors are actually still physical wires on chips, which you can imagine is really big. And so if you can scale that down using something like, you know, a pattern topological material, uh, that would be much more effective in, in devices. There's, there's a whole articles on topological anti-ferromagnetic spintronics for devices, electrically controlled magnetism in in, in ferromagnetic topological insulator heterostructures. So there's a lot of ideas here about how to use these properties for next generation devices as well. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that we've been interested in from a physics perspective then is, you know, if you, a lot of pe people have made devices, but even in these, in, even in the memory devices that people make, the mechanisms are still a little bit unclear. It's not known if you make a device exactly how the surface is coupled to each other, how far the proximity extends, uh, what is the nature of the, of, the, of the topological surface state. It's not clear whether the surface state matters, right? That was the question, that if you have something that's spin split that's not topological, would you see the same effect? 
And so from a physics point of view, these are questions that we were interested in. What matters, what properties of the surface state matter when you proximitize them to see effects that are relevant to spintronics type devices? Um, and so I'm going to talk about, and so this is, you know, magnetic proximity effects have been seen before in transport. So here again, we're not talking about making a device. We're just talking about making, you know, putting a bilayer on and measuring the resistance and seeing what features appear to try to characterize this proximity better. Um, and so, you know, here's an experiment that came out some, some time ago of just bismuth solenoid on a, um, on a magnetic insulator, YIG. Uh, and what you see here are just these, these little switching dips that occurred in, as a function of a perpendicular field and then hysteretic peaks that occur as a function of, of in-plane field. Um, and, you know, I, I come from a... I come from a superconducting background, and so it's always funny to me to see in magnetism, you know, all you ever look for is hysteresis. It doesn't matter what you, what what you want to get. Like, as long as you see hysteresis, you know it's a magnetic effect, and you, you send it out there. So in this case, you know, these, these are hysteretic, so they're, they're due to the magnetism. But the origins of these features was just, is just not well characterized and not well known. So in this paper, they, they said that this sort of switching um, corresponds to switching of the underlying magnet. So there is, there is proximity effect um, you know, the magnetism cans out of plane is what they, is what they guessed, um, and that you have domains of different states. And so this, these sort of domains are created when you have a magnetic field and you get scattering off domain walls, and that increases the resistance with an in-plane field. Okay? But then you have another paper that came out around the same time, and when they put on an in-plane field, what they see are dips instead of peaks. And actually, I know it looks like that one, but this is with an in-plane field. So this... Here they see peaks, and here they see dips for the same field. And here they also attribute it to, to domain walls, um, but said in this case the domain walls led to a decrease in conductance, or a decrease in resistance. Okay, so, so there's a little bit of confusion here. You see hysteretic features, you see dips and peaks, um, but there's very little understanding, you know, when I, I, I again... I don't want to insult magnetics people, but if I feel like whenever there's lack of understanding at interfaces in magnetic systems, you just say it's domain walls. And, you know, domain walls do a lot of things. Right? They, they scatter in different ways. They lead to resistance. They lead to conductance. Um, but at the end of the day, it's really hard to interpret what effect topology or the surface states have when, there's, when you attribute, you see little things that are due to domain walls. So there need, you know, it seemed to me there need to be more understanding of these sort of transport and interface effects. Um, and there's also, you know, one of the things we wanted to look at was anisotropic magnetoresistance, which is looking at what happens to the resistance as you rotate the magnetic field um, in plane or out of plane. Uh, in, in this case, um, an AMR generally occurs um, when you have magnetization parallel to your current. Um, from scattering, you get high resistance, and then when magnetization is perpendicular to your current, you get low resistance. So you expect a peak like this that varies... Um, from high, from high resistance to low resistance, depending on the orientation of your magnetism with respect to the current. Okay. Now, in topological insulators, uh, you should also see an AMR, but it should be different from the standard type of AMR. Um, in this case, what you should see is in the gap state, when you have a, a magnetic field that's out of plane, for example, you should have a gap, um, and this should give you a high resistance state. Now, if you apply an in-plane field, then it should rotate the magnetization and close the gap. Because for a topological material, you expect the gap for an out-of-plane field, but not for an in-plane field. And so as you close the gap, you should go from high resistance to low resistance, going from an out-of-plane to an in-plane field. Um, and so this, is, this has been modeled before. There's a form that, that this sort of closing of the gap is expected to take. And I mentioned that this is really different from conventional anomalous magnetoresistance, because in this case, it's due to a surface state gap and not related to the orientation of the current. Um, and you expect a high resistance when the magnetization is out of plane, and it should be independent of in-plane angle. So that's, that's completely opposite of standard mag AMR, which depends on the relative direction of the, of the magnetic field and your current. So it only depends on your in-plane angle. Okay. okay, so we set out to measure this. Uh, again, we use these, uh, these 3D topological insulators. Um, uh, we believe that in these systems, uh, based on our doping and other, and other, and other properties, that our, that our Fermi energy was, was close to the gap in this case. Uh, we, again, have thin flakes that are exfoliated from bulk crystals using scotch tape method. Um, I mentioned here that the flakes are actually important because... If you try to do these experiments on MBE-grown systems, in MBE, there's often a dead layer at the interface between one material and another. So if you have a ferromagnetic 
topological system, it's unclear exactly what's happening at the interface there. Um, you can see, you know, it, they're very controllable, they're beautiful systems, but for something where you want a really good proximity coupling at the interface, or at least to control it really well, it's, some, it's sometimes, you know, ironically harder to do with MBE, because even though it looks really pretty, chemically at the interface, it's not clear what's happening. So in our case, we have exfoliated flakes and just plop them down directly on the magnetic material, and then we know exactly what's at the interface. Usually a little bit of dirt and some coupling. <laughs> so at least we know what we have there. There's no other layers in between there. Okay, so uh, we exfoliated uh, bismuth selenide onto YIG. Uh, YIG is, is, we sputtered these, it's, uh, it's a thin film. Uh, this is what the samples looked like. Okay, this is a false color green, but this is where the leads are. And it's just a flake that's a couple microns in size. And then we rotated the field from out of plane to in plane. Um, and just to start with a characterization of the YIG, this is, this is a magnetic material in itself. Um, it's not conducting, and so we did this, looked at just the magnetic moment in a physical, in a magnetic property, measurement property system. Um, but you can see that the YIG has a coercive field of about two Ersteds. So the YIG switches its magnetization at about two Ersted, which is a very small field. Uh, we also characterize a bismuth selenide. Um, we sometimes, so again, so this is the other problem. When you're dealing with flakes, it's nice because you get clean samples that you can couple to things, but you also get what you get. And so we tried again to have pretty thin samples, but when we measured them, we sometimes saw different sorts of behavior. Again, depend, we can't control exactly where the Fermi energy is in these systems. We just have to get, you know, try the ones that have, seem to have the Fermi energy closest to within the gap. In this case, we found that some samples showed me metallic behavior consistent with surface states, and some showed semiconducting behavior consistent with the bulk freezing out at low temperatures. Um, and, you know, what we found is that we get stronger proximity Oh, sorry. Let's go the other way. Sorry. This is the bulk in this case. It's metallic. And this is the, where, the, where the bulk freezes out and you have the surface states. And we saw proximity magnetization only in the semiconducting devices. So when we saw metallic devices, uh, we didn't see ferromagnetic effects. And we had semiconducting devices. We did. So we associate these with where, we, again, where we have surface state conductance dominating. Okay, um, and this is the data that we saw in, these, in this case. So here we, what you're seeing is uh, a function of, of, it's a YIG bismuth selenide bilayer where we apply a strong in-plane field. And so what we expect to see is the, is the magnetization, is you start with a gap at zero field, so you should have high resistance. And then as we apply the in-plane field, we rotate out of plane until we get a low resistance. And so this was really nice, but it also we want to note that what we see here is a really, a really large peak, a 6.5% peak is much bigger than what's been seen before. Before those little dips that I showed you are something like 0.1% dips. And in this case, this is a 6% peak. Um, it comes on only at low temperatures. Uh, this is both good and bad. We, uh, we went to ferromagnetic heterostructures to try to get room temperature effects. And so it's somewhat disappointing that we see things coming on at low temperatures. On the other hand, if you're curious whether it's a surface state in bismuth selenide or some other semiconducting effect that should happen at any temperature, the fact that there's an onset at low temperatures is consistent with it being related to the surface state and not to just some other band trivial um, state that, that always exists in these systems. And the other thing we note is that the switching scale that we see is something like 500 Ersted, which is 25 times larger than the YIG switching. And so what we believe we're seeing is switching of the surface state and not of the underlying um, material. Uh, this is the in-plane angle dependence. There is none. So unlike a conventional AMR peak, we don't have any dependence on the relative direction of the field and the current. So it's clearly not conventional AMR. Um, and you can see that there's, uh, it's both hysteretic and, uh, and it looks the same in, in plane and out of plane. Not in plane and out of plane. It looks, it looks the same at any direction in plane, 0 and 90 degrees. Okay. Yeah. I'll repeat your question. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that hysteretic curve uh, for the YIG uh, part, uh, was it measured with the uh, uh, insulator attached with the topological insulator or just, just YIG without? It's just YIG without. But then when you put something on top with spinorbic coupling, you, you, you can just get uh, anisotropy from that, right? And yeah. then it's sort of reasonable that uh, the field is much larger. If it's an yes. easy axis anisotropy, yes. then of course it, it'll be much larger than yes. the switching field. Yes, which is Sorry. what we see. That's exactly oh, okay. right. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, so that's, yeah, so good. That's exactly, so that's exactly what we see. And what I'll show is that, is that we do believe that we're switching. So 
so the point here is the YIG is doing the switching, but it's doing the switching in a much higher field than would happen with the YIG alone, which implies that you are getting some sort of coupling between the YIG and the bismuth solenoid, right? Which is the first order, at least, to see that sort of coupling. And then the magnitude of the effect and the, and the temperature scale of the effect tells you that it's likely a surface state effect in the bismuth solenoid itself. So that combination tells you that there's likely some sort of surface state switching in this case. You don't like that? Possibly. How's that? <laughs> yeah. One would measure just the theoretic first without, without any transfer of current, just the theoretic first with the uh, with the topological equation filled. And if that widens the sphericity, yeah. you know that's something basically happening. Yeah, but, but, but YIG is an insulator, y right? The, so. so Yeah. To see whether it changes uh, the magnetic field. Uh, well, but but it's already, it's already when, when you put the topological film on top, it's already coupled at that point, right? Yeah. So. But, but this way, this way, you would see whether this transport magnetic field scale corresponds to the this way this loop magnetic field scale with the uh, with the topological film. I. Yes, and so, yes, so we didn't, I mean, so the, 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 reason, the reason we didn't do that is that, you know, if you measure this, at least in a magnetic property, measurement property system, you have to have a little crystal or piece of it, and these are patterned films, and so we couldn't put this, we couldn't do the same measurements of the patterned film that we could do with the little crystal of, of YIG, basically, but otherwise you could measure that directly, but if, without measuring that directly, we just have to infer that, um, that, that, you know, we know we have, that the YIG is insulating, so any effects here have to be in the bismuth solenoid, and there's something switching here at a much, lar much larger scale than ever switches in the YIG alone, right? You know, 100 times larger than the YIG. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, you don't see any uh, saturation in your resistance as a function of temperature, right? Or your semiconducting... Uh, as we go to low temperature, we see the resistance, it... it uh, we didn't go to low enough temperature to see a saturation to the surface state regime. Is that what you're saying? I mean, yeah. we saw the resistance go up, but we didn't go to much lower temperatures. You didn't see if there is any saturation. We whatsoever. didn't. We didn't go to low temperature. We, I, we didn't see it, but it doesn't mean that it's not there. It just means we probably didn't okay. go to low enough temperature. And you didn't to try it. to make the same experiment for uh, to see the resistance for a uh, flaking on top of a non-magnetic insulator, just to see if the resistance changes from. If the wig is affecting, we, 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 ha we have uh, done many experiments with a flake on top of non-magnetic insulators, and we don't see switching effects or anything like but that. But the our resistance as a function of temperature is the same, or does it, it change? Depend, it depends on the flake. Okay. It, it depends. We sometimes do see the semiconducting behavior, and we sometimes do see the metallics. So that just depends on the flake. Okay. okay. But if, if you just take a flake that's not on a magnetic material, we never we never see this effect. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um. So at least this behavior is consistent with the rotation of the, of the, of the, of the surface state's magnetization. Um, we note that there's the small dips that appear here are consistent with what was seen before on, on these MBE multilayers that were associated with domains. Um, they, they look very similar and have very similar characteristics. So it's possible that these states appear with some level of, of proximity coupling, but with a very strong level of proximity magnetization, you get much larger peaks appearing at, at lower temperatures. Um, and so we can model this, this sort of behavior just using, just using a very simple free energy analysis, uh, which takes into account the, uh, the alignment of the magnetization, the shape anisotropy, and the uh, uniaxial anisotropy, basically, of the, of the topological material using the Shiba formula that was, uh, that was published earlier. Um, and when we do the free energy calculation, we can see the basic shape here, but you can see we miss these features at top, and this is because this doesn't take the YIG into account at all, right? This just takes the top, the bismuth solenoid into account. So if we then, ignore that. So if we then fit, we model it just using micromagnetic simulations with a layer of a topological material, uh, interface with YIG, and then YIG on the bottom, uh, we can exactly model this. This is simply micromagnetics, just looking at a layered material, and just looking at what, what happens if you have um, the magnetization at the interface rotating with the field, um, and you can see that we fit that, that really well. Um, and that these peaks here seem to be due to the pinned YIG-TI switching. And as was mentioned, this, this happens at 
you know, fields 50 times larger than what would happen with YIG alone. And so there's some interaction that's actually changing the anisotropy in the YIG with the coupling to the business solenoid. Okay. Um, I can ignore that. Uh, the other thing to mention is that there is there is this temperature effect, and so this is this is somewhat disappointing. Um, it's like I said, it's it's good in the sense that that having some sort of temperature effects is consistent with an onset of of coherence or something in the surface state. Um, you know that we can model it with some sort of thermal fluctuations, destroying uh, the magnetization in the surface state at at higher temperatures and having uh, a, a, a coherent magnetization at low temperatures, and so. This is nice in the sense that it shows that something is onset. Again, it's very if you if you measure YIG alone, you don't see any onset temperature effects at low low temperatures. It's basically the same from one Kelvin all the way up to room temperature. I mean, the history says changes size changes, but you never see features like this that onset or that go away. And so this is again consistent with a surface state, but. Um, but the reason that this onsets at four Kelvin and low temperatures, I, I don't know, right? And so it's interesting to me that this happens only at this temperature, but presumably it's some crossover between magnetic or order and thermal fluctuations. Okay. And so the takeaway here is that there's, there seems to be really clear evidence of proximity magnetization. Um, there's evidence of competing anisotropies between, um, between the YIG and the TI, where the TI magnetization is coherently rotating with an in-plane field, creating this new type of strong AMR peak, um, and it's consistent with having a gapped TI surface with an with out-of-plane magnetization at, at remnants. Um, so again, to answer the question, can we, you know, how do we know that there are surface states here? Because it's, it's, it's not, it's not consistent with the, the, the temperature dependence and the peak and the behavior is at least more consistent with surface states than with any other states that could appear in these systems. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to say a little bit more about trying to do this again on a ferromagnetic metal. Here we are talking about doing something on a magnetic insulator, but if you want to have a real spin torque device, you have to look at the coupling with a ferromagnetic metal and a topological material. And so we basically tried to do a very similar thing with a top with top with business solenoid on top of um, silicon silicon oxide, which is gated, um, and then having cobalt platinum multilayers on top. And cobalt platinum multilayers have an out-of-plane magnetization, which is why we use these to see what happens when we couple these materials. And again, in this case, we can see this um, strong out-of-plane perpendicular magnetic anisotropy of the cobalt platinum. And you can see the typical AMR of the cobalt platinum. The scale here is something like, you know, 0.08% um, at, at room temperature. I'm sorry, at, at, low, at, at room temperature and then much lower at, at low temperatures. So it's usually less than 1% of the magnetoresistance. Okay, so in this case, we, uh, we again took a 26 nanometer thick flake of, of bismuth solenoid. We put cobalt platinum multilayer on top. And what we observe is a 20% change in the magnetoresistance. Magneto magneto um, so at, you know, the field scale here is much smaller than what we saw with the YIG. Okay? But in this case, we can see that about um, 10 millitesla, we get this hysteretic switching with a very large change in magnetoresistance, again, much larger than what you'd expect from AMR or any sort of other change of the magnet alone. And what was interesting here is you see, you see that the switching occurs for all field directions. You know, if you have something like a spin valve effect, which is where you have uh, magnetic moments either aligned or anti-aligned, and you expect to see, as you increase the fields, go from higher resistance to low resistance back to higher resistance again, then uh, you would expect to see um, that only occur for, say, in-plane fields, but not for out-of-plane fields. But here we see it for all three field directions, which is unusual. We also see a strong temperature dependence, again, at around the same scale. Uh, we can see that this onsets around one Kelvin, and uh, it increases as you go to lower and lower temperatures. So again, a little unfortunate if we want to make room temperature spintronics devices, but interesting if we're trying to show that there's something that happens at low temperatures where, again, the magnet, cobalt, you know, cobalt platinum is a metal, and so it doesn't have any sort of onset temperature that you expect in these temperature ranges. Okay. Um, so, you know, to, to us, this is a, a strong effect of the bismuth solenoid because of the temperature dependence, because we see these peaks um, for both uh, for X and Y in plane fields, um, and also the switching field is much lower than you'd expect for a cobalt platinum in this case with a much greater magnitude AMR effect. 
Uh, another thing that we noticed that was sort of interesting is, uh, is that if you, if you look at the magnitude as a function of in-plane angle, the magnitude stays exactly the same. But you see that there's, if you go to the next slide, you can see that, I'll go back here actually, you can see that it groups, when it switches, it, it groups into three different switching values, right? So by switching, we're just going up in field, down in field, up in field, down in field, as a function of the angle of the field, of the in-plane field. And as a function of angle of in-plane field, we just have three places where it predominantly switches. Um, and we believe that this sort of threefold symmetry in the switching is related to the, uh, is related to the threefold structure of bismuth solenoid. So again, for whatever reason, in the switching, the magnetic switching mimics the, uh, the threefold structure of, of bismuth solenoid itself. Okay. Okay. Um, so we, we worked with, with, uh, with Matthew Gilbert's group on a theoretical model. Um, this model was basically very similar to the model that we, that we, uh, that, that they created for the, for the YIG, looking at, at, you know, switching of one layer on top of the other, sort of like a spin valve type effect. Um, you know, this, this, uh, you know, it, this clearly wasn't a domain wall effect. It looks something more like a spin valve type effect. Uh, the only complication here is that this sort of spin valve effect explains the in-plane field switching, but not the out-of-plane field switching. And so, you know, the other thing that could happen if you, if you have switching that occurs in all three field directions, that could be due to something like skirmions, which don't care about the field direction. They have their own structure um, or something more exotic like that. And so that's the sort of thing that we have no... No actual basis for it, but at least it's consistent with what we see and that we're looking at more now. Okay, so, um, so in conclusion for, for today's talk, uh, you know, we have these surface states that can show these prominent switching effects when, when coupled to ferromagnets and uh, metals and insulators, but only at low temperatures. Um, again, I don't know what sets the temperature scale, but it's definitely there. Uh, these, these TI magnetic, oops, these TI magnetic heterostructures do seem to have significant promise in spin torque magnetic memory devices, but more work needs to be done to understand exactly what that coupling is and to control it, um, especially that proximity coupling. Um, and we just need better control over this coupling to surface states, decreasing de disorder and increasing it with CMOS before we can move on to anything that's, that's practical or even before we can study these effects in more detail. And with that, I'll end. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's perfectly on time. So Thank you. Have, uh, Set the trend. <laughs> Although we can end early and then everyone else can be late. <laughs> no, we can end early. I keep telling you. <laughs> I'm doing everyone a favor by <laughs> not running late today. <laughs> Well, because it's because I could skip because I could skip over all the hall, anomalous hall slides. <laughs> Didn't have to explain anything there. I just zoomed right through. So, yeah. So I have one question. Like uh, when you grow this material using sputtering, so there you cannot expect some surface state, right? Because in sputter film, it's hard to get the surface state in bismuth selenide usually. I I'm sorry. Can you can you repeat that just more slowly? Yeah, it uh, means you saw something like bismuth selenium with some cobalt platinum heterostructure device. Mm -hmm. It's grown on sputtering. Yeah. So it's not hard to get the surface state there because it's a sputter film rather than MB or a flake. So in that case, the, the bismuth selenide is still a flake. And then we evaporate, then we, 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 we sputter the, well, we just evaporate the cobalt platinum on top. Okay. So yes, we, we still use flakes in that case. Yeah, but even, but even there we worry about, so there, there, is, there was some worry about the interface there because you know, then you have to have a platinum seeding layer and then the cobalt platinum film grows on top. And so if you want to model what the proximity coupling is, you have to know exactly how thick that seeding layer is and what the effect of it is. And so there, there is an issue. And that's why I think people who are looking at just layers of you know, 2D ferromagnets on top of a 2D topological material, you don't worry about that in the same way. Because again, you get a really nice interface and it's just one on top of the other. But then again, you can't control the magnetization in the same way. So there's always a trade-off. Yeah. <laughs> so is there any work going on synthesizing some naturally occurring heterostructures of these type of materials, like uh, transition metal dye calculates? Like that? 
Is that you're saying so? So could so could we take the two D layered materials oh, and make oh, stacks yeah. of these? Yes, you can. And I think that's a, it's, I think that's a really interesting direction to go for this. And I think you could see a lot of these behaviors. I mean, there's there is some as I mentioned. There, the only issue there is you want to you want to really control the magnetization and make sure it's very robust. And so we did choose cobalt platinum because it has a known out of plane moment. Um, a lot of these other materials may or may not have the magnetization that you want for these experiments because the bismuth solenite has an out of plane moment, we think. Um, but yes, I think the, probably the best direction to move forward is by layering, by layering these with magnetic 2D materials, probably. So I think that theor theoretically, if your magnetic moment was in plane, the Dirac cone would also be moving. Yeah. Do you, is there a way to see it shifting around? Maybe not in transport, but do you know, like, have people seen that in ARPES or maybe in transport there's something clever to do? With an in-plane, so do you, you know see a I moving mean? of the Dirac so cone of yeah, an in-plane field. That's what yeah. I thought would happen. I thought it would shift a little. And I was also wondering if it even shifts enough to be observable or if the scales are such that it's just sitting at, yeah. That, that makes a domain wall look like a, like a magnetic field, actually. Like orbital magnetic uh, field. Like yeah. It's a shift that depends on coordinates, so it's like a vector potential. Yeah. So it creates orbital magnetic field. But, but if you, you've never seen some right. evidence of that, yeah, okay. And then I'm trying, I mean, people must have done ARPIS in, in I fields, was right? If it was something you had just seen. Like, I don't remember seeing it, but I thought, you know, maybe someone else had remembered seeing it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't remember what the energy scale is yeah. too, right? Yeah, it, it could be that you have to apply a really that's large was, field to see that. And given the sharpness of the Dirac point, you're just not going to see. Because people have done all sorts of, yeah, yeah, measurements on these, and I don't think they've seen that. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. I thought you were going to do some experiments in high order topological. <laughs> 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 we care about those too. Any, yeah. any more questions? If not, then let's uh, yeah. have a hand.